So I would like you to welcome Joseph on stage. He will give us another talk about Swift UI. So big round of applause, please. Hello. Uh, can you hear me well? Raise of hands in the back row to know if I yell or shout. Perfect. So welcome to my talk. I will dive directly in. And as you know, why Swift was a mistake, and we should have kept using Objective-C. <laughs> <laughs> I could see some people freaking out here in the front, like, no, we just got rid of it. <laughs> and maybe the younger people in the audience were like, what is Objective-C? <laughs> So no, no, also in our team, we wanted to go forward with the future, and we wanted to check if Swift UI, ah, it, is, it is black, it is supposed to be black. <laughs> and uh, yes, so we also were asking ourselves the question, like, should we uh, switch to Swift UI? Is it a good time to go forward and switch to Swift UI from our UI kit code base? Because the app is running, and everything is fine, users are happy, so what is pushing us to move forward? So we came up with a bunch of uh, points, and uh, I was very happy to watch the previous presentation to see that she had also the exact same points that we also figured out in our team, why uh, they drove us to basically do the switch and do this effort. Uh, so first, we can use previews, which speeds up code development a lot. Uh, we have also less code to write, which means uh, lighter pull requests, quicker reviews, and also we don't have to maintain as much as a big code base. Uh, third is no storyboards. Although we were not using storyboards in UIKit, but whoever did that know the pain because the UIKit framework was based on storyboards. So every time you need to create a new view controller, you have to write these two annoying functions, init with nib, and the other one with the codable with fatal error. So you have just to carry around. So now we don't have to do that anymore. And the third one, and the most important one, it was fast. Fast not mean fast for the user. The user doesn't notice if it's two milliseconds quicker. It's fast for us to develop, to ship features, and to create business value, basically. Um, as just a fun challenge that I did for this conference, I went through my uh, Git commit history and checked uh, the average, uh, I saw the, the minutes between commits when I was coding with UIKit, and the minutes between commits when I started coding in SwiftUI, and just did the average, Please, this is personal to me. If your numbers aren't like this, don't uh, get desperate and say like, ah, no, I should uh, stick with shift here. Uh, but I noticed that there's like 20% um, more efficiency, sort of. I was quicker in delivering uh, commits, which translates normally in, in quicker code. That's at least how I decided to interpret this metric. Feel free to interpret it as you want. Um, yes, so also intended to be black. <laughs> so basically what happens is that if your team, you sit down and you decide that SwiftUI is the way to go forward, basically you have a lot of issues that you need to deal with. And one of them is we're going to tackle in this um, talk is how to re-architect or just a fresh point of view on architecture with SwiftUI. How does SwiftUI change our thought for architecture? I mean, after 10 years of working with UIKit on a daily basis, something has stuck and now we need to change it, which takes a lot of effort. But I hope this talk would uh, help you a bit and give you some pointers. So my goal from this perspective, not to give you like uh, uh, 10 uh, secret points for your project that you follow and then in 20 days you become uh, like the best SwiftUI app. It's basically our take on the problems that we saw while switching to SwiftUI, what did we decide to do compromises and how we tackled it inside the team. So you get a fresh perspective to take back to your own team and to your own projects and try to apply them. So let's talk about the main issue. What is the main issue that we're trying to solve? This. That's our main issue. For the more seasoned people in here, um, you know it's called MVC. Basically, it's a model view controller. That's what Apple uh, preached to us for the past six, seven years uh, before SwiftUI came out. And this was the get-go, basically, from Apple, and that's how they built their UI kit framework around. So everything you see, UI view controllers, views, and their models. And the idea behind it is that views and models uh, need to be lightweight. That's what was the uh, whole point of this. And all the logic needs to go in my controller. So the controller actually uh, takes user input. The controller needs to make uh, requests, fetch data, react to updated uh, 
uh, core data stuff, and then also push updates alongside. Um, just to tell you that it's not out of the blue, I have a small example that I will carry along in this talk. So just focus for two minutes so you know what it is about. And uh, then we're gonna start uh, looking at like better ways to, to solve it. So don't, uh, don't freak out when you see it. So the idea is, this is a real example of our app. Where the app needed to do one simple task, not one, uh, one view of that app, need to do a simple task. Gather your current location, check the public transport station around you, pick the closest one, and show you the departure board from that station. So easy and nothing fancy, nothing complicated, no black magic. Just <laughs> open the app. Ah, this stop, the bus comes in five minutes, then you go. This was the feature. And if we look at the data flow, we basically, once we appear, we try to get the location. If everything goes well, we go get the station. If everything goes well there, then we go get the board. And if it, everything goes well, we display it to the user. This translated into, this is my best effort to keep it on one slide. I omitted a lot of code <laughs> and had to use extensively the three dot feature of Xcode. Uh, it's, it was the first time I used it on the entire file. Normally I use it on each uh, function. But uh, yeah, if you can see, basically the view controller needs to uh, deal with location, uh, fetching and location updates. The, uh, the view controller needs to also deal with networking, need, needs to deal with UI updates, and needs to deal with um, user action. And this is not uh, less than 600, 700 code file. So um, a lot of people tried to mitigate that. We'll talk about different architecture and why this was a big issue. But uh, just to summarize it, this was the main star of uh, for the past couple of years. And now um, SwiftUI basically came and say like, this we don't use anymore. So you ended up with uh, code that you used to put in your view controller and now you're like, yeah, where should I put this code? <laughs> yeah, cool, I mean, we have a new framework, SwiftUI is cool, we can build quick, but what should I do with the code that I already have in my view controller and want to migrate away from SwiftUI? Uh, so the promised slide, uh, you can basically have any four or five uh, letters, acronym, architectures, and each one promises to solve this issue in a way where to split your massive view controller into smaller one. I don't know if you know the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I just made it up, to, to, just to tell you that yeah, <laughs> there's just too many of them. And um, according to my experience, working in the industry for more than 10 years, there are as many architectures as apps on the App Store because every team starts with an architecture saying, okay, we're gonna do MVVM. Um, two, three weeks down the line, it becomes something unique to that team. And the moment your lead developer switches to a better paying job, then basically it's haywire from there. <laughs> Nobody's there to maintain the, the architecture. So uh, we decided to drop these names. We don't say anymore, hey, we're using MVVM, we're using some fancy words. Uh, we said, okay, we don't have a name for our architecture, but what do we want, what do we expect from the architecture? And this helped us a lot to rethink a bit about, about our code, about how do we deal with, uh, with problems. Uh, the first one uh, to, to come up is that we want it to be modular. What does, what does it mean, modular? We hear it a lot. It means that if tomorrow my supplier of payments, because we don't handle payment, decide to go bankrupt, how long do I need to do to switch to another provider of payments? That's basically the first line. If we could minimize that and change just one part of the code without touching the rest, then we achieve the success here. The second one is single source of truth. Um, this is not some Illuminati stuff, it's just code. We want to make sure that we don't have two different uh, values for the same mental uh, model for, this, for, the, for the user. If the user looks at the station board, uh, going back to the example, I want him to see the latest. I want, I want to use his latest location. I don't want him to see two different states in two parts of the app. Third one is scalability. It is very important. Every project, every team starts small, and then nobody expects it, but we grow so quick. And if the architecture does not support scalability, you'll find yourself trying hacks, rewriting parts of the code, and just wasting time and effort understanding what other people were doing. Uh, fourth one, 
And this is very underrepresented in our uh, iOS community because Apple does not believe in testability. But <laughs> believe it or not, tests are your friend. And without tests, you have no guarantee that whatever you changed at 2 AM in the morning for the release next day will work and not break half of the other part of the app. So testability is very important, and the architecture should support that. And last, this is for uh, whoever is managing also teams. Um, we know in our, in our um, industry, a lot of people are come and go because it's a highly volatile market where developers just find better paying jobs, switch, and you have lead people getting promoted, switching to management or something like this. It needs to be easy to teach and to maintain. So nobody feels that he's intimidated by a complex architecture. And the moment <coughs> developers feel intimidated, the code quality will tank. Because they were like, OK, I just copy what happened before. So I don't have to think why it is uh, done like that. And that's the biggest problem. If you don't think, it means that you cannot improve. And the last point is there to avoid that. So, uh, what does Apple say about these five points? And with SwiftUI, well, Apple has no opinion. They never like published any talk or any statement that says use MVC, like they did with UIKit. They said, use whatever floats your boat. We give you the tools, you decide to solve the problem. Or we give you the problem, you decide to find the solution. Depends on how you're, uh, how you're looking at it. But my number one um, uh, tip for everyone is don't fight the system. People have strong opinions sometimes about architecture. And if you try to go head to head with the system, with SwiftUI, for example, or UIKit beforehand, there will be one loser, and it's you. Because you'll spend tearless night, uh, nights just crying about why stuff aren't working like you want. So don't fight the system. And we could see how Apple changes their ideas of a lightweight view into a view that handles more responsibility. We could get some hints from how they handle core data. They are not afraid to give us an example where they pipe core data objects directly into the view, and the view reacts to core data updates. So they do not mind it anymore. Before it was a lightweight. Now, suddenly, it has business logic inside and data piped into it. The environment, that's basically the new structure uh, for the question before. Uh, also, they don't mind piping environment objects straight into the view. And they didn't do it as a mistake, and they realized, like, ah, no, now we're stuck with all the API. They are redoing it again with Swift Data Framework, which is their latest uh, addition. They also have their macros to pipe data directly into your view, and they encourage you to do it. So what does that mean for us? So we have to start taking a fresh view, basically, on the subject. Um, that's a very basic example, like the simplest I could find. It's a Boolean. If it's true, we show a view. If it's false, we show another one. And if we desiccate it into smaller pieces, we could check that the first line is basically an equivalent of a view model. That's uh, if, uh, if we follow the MVVM pattern. So the first one holds our, mo uh, our uh, well, model, and the second part is basically the view controller that decides what does the view needs to show at what time. And all of that is inside the view. Now, we talked about model view controller. And what Apple did is just took away the controller. So now we end up with model view. And that's basically what the SwiftUI, at least f from our understanding, that what the SwiftUI framework is aimed to. We get rid of that. We have only two elements. And then we are happy. But that doesn't solve a lot of issues. We still have code somewhere floating. And what we decided to add for this is the concept of services. You can call them helper. You can call them whatever. Um, the idea of a service is basically some related code that we could extract, put together, does the same thing. Uh, it has abstraction level where people using that service do not need to know the inner implementation of that service. They just know I give it that input, it gives me that output, I'm happy with it, I can continue my life. Uh, it is deterministic. That is one of the most important points. <coughs> and we'll see later for tests. Deterministic is for a given input, we can expect always the same output. It doesn't just go crazy in the middle. Um, and reusable for sure, just for obvious reason to save ourselves some time in the future. So uh, where can we use this service concept in our 
huge file that did the location and stuff. First area of improvement, the location service. Actually, it fits a bit this point. We could extract it. It's uh, self-contained. I just need to know, hey, I just need to ask it, give me the location. It gives me the location. I don't need to know how it gets it via payments, paying someone, or just asking Apple straight away. That's it. And normally when I decide to do a service, I always go with the state first. And this helps to illustrate a bit the mental model of our service. So in that case, what, I, what do I expect from this, from this service, the location service, is either it tells me I'm uninitialized, so nobody knows what's happening, Either it's authorizing, asking the user, is it okay to steal your location and give it to a third party? The third one is unauthorized, if the user is aware and says like no. Or in the other case where he says yes and he trusts you with your data, with his data, then it's fetching the first location or having a location or a failure. And that's basically all I need from that service. So once I define this state, I can go and say, what do people need to use my service? <coughs> so, as you can see, it's just an observable object like Apple recommends for us to do. Uh, always uh, conform to this and have a published. I don't know if the people in the back, maybe I put it too low, but uh, it's no uh, magic. You could uh, go online and search published, you get 20 examples of that. So, it's just a standard uh, service model. <coughs> um, a small snippet about the resume, doesn't do anything fancy, it just maps the um, authorization status into the state that I defined. It also does more under the hood with the delegate callback, I just omitted it because we don't want to look at cause, you do that in your job for pull request every day. And if I want to write the SwiftUI view, it's as simple as just conforming to that observ observed object and letting the whole system just update itself every time you have a new state. Cool, 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 but people would say, yeah, how do you test this? Like you've been preaching about testability and how can we make sure that our view looks as we expected? Well, you can't with this architecture. And also the previews are broken uh, because we are piping directly core location into the previews which do not work. So thank you, Apple, for this uh, tutorial, but we need something else. We need to define some protocol to break this dependability between services and view. And if you define correctly your service, basically it's one step away from, a, from becoming a protocol. If you try that, Xcode will complain. It will say, yeah, you wanted the protocol, all is fine, but this property wrapper, I'm not okay with it. So take it away. Then you're stuck with Apple recommends that we use published and we want to break our code so it's more testable and reusable. How can we do that? So the solution we went with, there are many, by the way. It's not the only unique solution. Feel free to experiment and other stuff. We took the add published property, which is the property wrapper, and we know exactly what, how it is implemented, and we broke it down into its two main components. The first one is a publisher, like the name suggests, and the second one is basically just to query the current state so that we know how to render, and the rest, is unchanged. So we only take this at published, split it in two, and then implement, in, incorporate in the protocol. You could see here that we skipped um, uh, conforming to observable object. You can still have it, doesn't hurt, but we didn't need it. So what does this mean? We have a bit of overhead. Instead of writing at published alone, and that's it, magic happens, we had to create a current value subject or use at published and then later inside the two uh, implementation of the protocol have to map them correctly to their, uh, to their correct state or to their correct uh, functionality. That's the overhead that you get. Then uh, next we can start writing mocks and by writing a mock we could see our view in preview and we could just decide how it needs to look like. Here I decided to uh, have a mock service that updates a, a random location every one second, for example. And that is possible now. We don't need to rely on core location for our previews. Um, also, nothing is stopping us for continuing this trend and switching all our networking calls into services. Here we went with two separate ones. You could do one big one. It's up to you. Um, so, summarizing a bit. 
what did we achieve so far with these services? First, we have uh, modular loose coupling. Since now it's a protocol, the view does not know the real implementation. We could swap it for a test. We could swap it for the real deal for the view. From the view point of view, it's just the protocol. Uh, second, it's a single source of truth because now my core location is a service. So if I reuse that service everywhere where I need location, I have one source of truth and not every single one needs to adhere to CI location manager and then handle the states inside. So now let's talk about the third point, scalability. Um, we wrote small services, but nothing is stopping us from growing these services and aggregating them. So we call it service composition. It's not uh, rocket science. It just take a bunch of small services, put them in a bigger service, and slap service on top. And it looks something like this. Same process, same concept. We go, stop, decide, OK, what do we want in our um, service? We want these states. Here we decided to split to show you a different way of, of uh, declaring states. It doesn't need to be an enum all, with, all the time. Here we went with two um, enums wrapped in a struct. And the idea is that you could technically be holding your phone looking at the timetable of a station and walking, but then your location gets updated. We do not want to show you the big loading spinner in the middle. We want to keep you see, to see your data and then notify you that something is happening. Once we have new data, we update. And like this, we could do it, for example. <coughs> so now we have basically the blueprint of our service with protocols and states. Uh, we take this and then we could, for example, implement it using other tiny uh, services that we wrote. And just um, if you take a moment and look at it, we are using protocols again and not the real implementation so that we could keep this modularity in our um, architecture or our code. <coughs> so uh, bonus points, this does not only apply to SwiftUI. So now since I have the service and I have older code in my app that still uses UIKit, I'm not forced to migrate it yet. I just need to clean it up and use what the, um, what, the what the service is publishing instead of just having to handle the code myself. So that is basically just observing the state and updating. And in SwiftUI counterpart, um, what we opted for the solution we opted, for sure there's a million of them, but we decided that this, the view will handle privately its own state, so it will translate whatever service state is coming its way into a private state and then updating it. Uh, like this, we don't have to um, deal with at observed, uh, observable object and observed objects. Uh, the trick is to have this on receive. Uh, whenever it gets a new state, just updates it, and then the view cycle will uh, render again. So third point, we have also a solution for it. We can scale stuff by using smaller services. Uh, testability. Now let's talk about the last point, and I think it's one of the most important. Protocol and dependency injection are basically our tools to achieve testability. That's what we did so far. Protocols, we know what it is. Dependency injection is basically by using the protocol as your variable, and then you can just put whatever you want, a mock, the real deal, or whatever. But we, did, we followed all of these. We still found there's one missing part in testability. We could not achieve 100% tests. So let's do a testability check of our... Um, service, or not service, sorry, of our um, user story, the one where you get your location and see the nearest station. So if I take a look at it, we have, basically that's the diagram. The smaller um, services talk directly to an API or to core data, then the more complex one talks to the smaller ones, and then the view will uh, basically observe the service. Now if I start um, separating my, my layers, the first one is mockable, since we can easily just, instead of going to a networking request, just do a local mock of it. Or we can also mock core location. Does not, uh, it's not something impossible to do. Our services, since they have published properties, we could observe them. So whenever we change something in the API, for example, we could see the, um, the result, the, the new state of my service. And I could write tests, deterministic tests. This is why it needs to be deterministic, uh, the service so that it doesn't fail every second time you run it. So, green check, we can test this layer. If we move the window, we can see, yeah, we can mock the smaller services since we are using protocols. We can observe the bigger service, it's nothing different than the smaller ones, so it is testable. 
And the last part, if we take a look, our service is mockable, but our Swift UI, we don't know how to observe it. It's just the body that we render, and it goes into the cosmos somewhere for Apple to deal with it and to render it into some UI kit or native components. There is no way to observe what's happening, so it is not testable. But uh, we figure out there is a solution for uh, every problem. And for this problem, we are using snapshot testing. Basically, snapshot testing is nothing um, like magic about it. It's just taking your view, rendering it, comparing it to a previous snapshot that we took when we were sure that it worked, and making comparison between both of them. If they match, pixel per pixel, you're good to go. Release, no problem. If one pixel is different, you're gonna get a failure, and basically you know uh, something changed, either from me or from someone else, component changed somewhere, and then it affected my uh, implementation of it. I just wanted to include a small uh, example. There is plenty of, um, of, uh, of examples online from, from this snapshot testing. You can go also go to point three on GitHub. They have an extensive talk about it. So the idea is that you import your snapshot testing, that's a Swift package, easy. Then you write your mock service, the first two lines, you configure it as you wish. You call your U, uh, Swift UI view, just create it as is. It, it also works for UIKit, so there's no, um, there's no like, compromise. You can also do it for UIKit. And the last two lines uh, just are needed for the framework to be able to snapshot and test your views. So that's all you need to do for, for example, to test one uh, set of states or how the service um, behaves. If we implement that in every single um, new service that we write, we reach a place where we can observe and test our last node in this architecture. And like this, we are sure from end to end that everything that we wrote when we were good developers will not be broken when we were rushing for the release the last minute. So, fourth point done. Fifth point, I leave it for you to, to decide if it's easy to learn or to teach. But from our uh, point of view, it was, since there's nothing outside of the um, toolbox that Apple gives, so develop new developers already are familiar with protocols, are familiar with publishing combined uh, states, and the only thing they needed to learn was test shot, uh, snapshot testing, sorry. Uh, but it wasn't that difficult since also it's very logical and um, very code light. You don't need to write too much for it. So, uh, conclusion. Basically, do not fight the system. If Apple gives us the tool to pipe stuff directly into, into the view and your app is small, do it. Don't be uh, like tempted to, uh, how am I going to put middle layers and have different, um, uh, test, like different aggregation. Just go with the system. And once you start growing, think of splitting and having a more complex architecture. Then, next one, uh, when writing a new feature, if you have a, already a code base, think of services. Like, what can I do for this new feature that can be a service that other people or other uh, modules in the, in the app can use? And third point, I don't know if I stressed that enough. Do not discard tests. It's really a life saver savior, especially when you're new in a company, and then you're just changing something, and then you have this reassurance that it will work and it doesn't break someone else's code, and your first commit will be, hey, fix that, it broke my code, which doesn't sound good on your, uh, on your employment uh, career. Uh, last one, sm start small. So what we did, uh, this is a bit of, um, of our journey. Your journey might be different. We decided not to go uh, full on Swift UI, had uh, first dive in, convert all the code base. We said, okay, the app is working in UI kit, let's leave everything. Maybe we pick a new feature, write it in Swift UI, see how it behaves. Does it give us issues? Does it give us problems? And also, most importantly, plan for a learning curve. We all think we know Swift UI until we start working with Swift UI. And um, because all the, the, the examples we, we've seen so far are basically to-do lists. And this is nice, but we rarely write to-do lists in our daily job. Um, another point <coughs> is keep previews in mind. 
from years and years of developing for UI kit, we tend to forget that a view can exist alone and can be seen alone. We always think of a bigger context. We need to run the project, have the simulator open, navigate, and see if my view works fine. Well, when you're starting to migrate to SwiftUI, think always like, what can I do for my code or for my architecture so that I embrace previous? So the next guy who's going to write a SwiftUI view does not, need to, um, does not need to spend hours on clicking through the app. He can directly look at the preview, use my protocol or mock so that he can go faster and implement the feature and see it in real time. Uh, last, this is also um, was stressed in the previous uh, talk. Navigation, I don't know, but I couldn't make it work with uh, cross, like cross technologies. So what we ended up also is a hybrid where the navigation is done with UIKit, and then we just use hosting controllers to uh, display our newly uh, created um, Swift UI views, basically. And that, we found it uh, pretty much good. It works as expected. It also saves us some time and some hassle. Maybe later, once Swift UI is more robust, or maybe we reach the point where we have enough Swift UI to justify a, swi a switch to a full Swift UI app, then maybe we rethink the navigation. Uh, also, one pain point that we discovered along the way is style guides. Uh, we all love our tiny libraries that we wrote for buttons and for styling. Um, we tried to have one library that is for both UIKit and SwiftUI, didn't work that much. So we rewrote the smaller components in SwiftUI, pure, and the older one we just left. So yes, this adds in a bit of uh, complexity and we need to make sure that every change we do in the UIKit needs to go in SwiftUI, but it just makes it a bit easier and everything just works. Last your OS version. Some features aren't available, um, depending on the OS version you pick. And also some stuff will behave weirdly, maybe performance hits you will get. So it's good to profile and test your app uh, on a real device, like with a small view that you do just to make sure that, yeah, we're not gonna have peak performance or peak memory uh, consumption. So uh, that was it. My name is Joseph. And I worked uh, for more than 10 years in the software industry. Eight of them are iOS, so I started with iOS 4 and moved my way up to now on 17. And the, some of my apps are uh, the banking apps. I worked a lot in the banking industry for a while um, at Credit Suisse, now is dead a bit. I don't know if you've read the papers. Um, also, uh, since I'm based in Switzerland, I worked on nearly all the major apps in Switzerland from the public uh, transport app, the federal one, the federal um, uh, weather app, the corona tracking, the corona certificate. These were like packed years for us uh, as developers. And um, lately now I'm part of Get Your Guide, uh, the app, and also developing the iOS app there. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Do we have questions? Yep. Uh, since you mentioned the point free guys, and I use snapshot testing in all my projects also, um, did you also look into their composable architecture? Yes, and we looked into it, and we deemed it too complex for now, because we have to change a lot. So uh, following a bit my, my points at the end, keep it simple at the beginning, test your, uh, your capability, can you afford a new uh, concept in your company? And then we opted for the time being to leave it aside since we have a lot of changes happening. We're implementing server-driven UI, which is another beast. So we said, okay, let's do one thing. If it fails, at least we know where it's failing. But it's a very interesting also concept. Um, so yeah, if you have the chance to try it, go for it, guys. Does that answer your question? Did you have more? Did you have more questions? Yeah, the other question is about testing again. Um, yeah. 
what makes you decide between XCUI tests and snapshot testing? So XCUI tests, we have maybe four or five in total. And this is basically end-to-end -end testing. That's how we see it. Uh, XCUI test for us is more of like, does the app works in general? And the snapshot testing is mainly similar to, um, to a um, XC test, like a small unit test, where if I'm developing a button and I just want to make sure that this button looks good in all its states, then the answer is snapshot testing. If I just want um, to have an end-to-end -end, um, just test, sanity test that my app, my user can reach three, down, three pages down the line, then it's gonna be uh, UI testing. There is another question there. Ah, here. <laughs> yeah, too bad, you missed your shot. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you for the great talk. Um, one additional question. So when you have these services, do you have any more additional rules uh, when and for what you create them? Because I could imagine in a very big project that you might end up in circular dependencies and such. Uh, yes, so we have a rule and it's a funny one because we said, okay, let's go with services and let's go like microservices. Then we realized it's too micro. So I, I think also it depends on the size of the project. If your project has a lot of, uh, like lot of features, then maybe having smaller uh, services does not justify the amount of overhead that you're gonna write. Then maybe it's better to group them. And that's what I said, like I call it service, but you can call it whatever you want. It's just the idea is that you group a bunch of code that you can think it's isolated from the rest and it can perform something. How big is that code is up to you. The example I gave were very small services just for the sake of this talk, so I don't spend two hours here explaining them. But there is like no set of rule that we, we put, a hard set of rule that we said, hey, a service needs to be just one network call. Um, so keep it flexible. At the end of the day, you're reviewing your, your uh, peers' code. So you can always suggest like, yeah, maybe that's making, that's doing too much. Let's split it. Um, and that's how basically it goes uh, with the conversation. But yeah, again, um, don't put too much rules that you cannot stick to, especially when you're moving to a new architecture. Let it loose, see how it goes, and then from there on become more and more complex as you know what are the failures of your project, what are the good stuff that worked for you. Hi, yeah, <clears throat> thank you uh, as well for your great talk. It was really nice. Um, my question is regarding snapshot testing. Um, first question, uh, did you, since uh, especially this um, snapshot uh, testing framework also uh, allows you to, for example, snapshot your API routes or snapshot certain um, analytics messages or configuration files to, to plain text, have you ever tried this? Uh, no, what we use it for is basically really snapshot testing as the name suggests. Maybe that would be something for the future, but we use a lot uh, also unit tests for, for example, analytics, since we also mock the analytics, so we could actually observe the firing order of, of uh, different stuff. But the framework itself, we use it just for comparing uh, snapshots. I think it's a good stepping ground, and work is never done, otherwise we'll be all unemployed. So it's always good to have uh, something to look forward to to improve in the app. Um, and then follow-up question, we, we are also using snapshot tests for more than two years now and really happy with it. Um, but there are also some minor drawbacks that are manageable, I would say. Um, but my question would be, which drawbacks did you um, observe yeah. when working with this? So the biggest pain uh, for, for me, at least with snapshot testing, is since you saw the code, basically it just tries to render your view inside a non-typical way, like outside of the hierarchy and the normal calls. Um, what happens sometimes, it ends up creating a bigger frame than it's supposed to create for some change that you will never think it will break. And you end up just thinking like what went wrong and now the snapshot test is 600 points big and your view is in the middle. Because for sure, if you're comparing pixel to pixel, you as a human, you're like, ah, but it looks good. But for a machine, it's gonna look at the reference photo, which is 200 pixel high. Then it will look at the new code that you just wrote and we're very proud of. It's 600 points high, and then it doesn't match. And when it does that, it creates also a diff. 
Normally, it's very helpful if they, ma they match, then you could see like what really changed. But in that case, for example, it's useless because it tries to compare it to the zero origin, and then you end up with comparing it to white and then the other one. So you have to go dig in. It did not happen too much. It happened for like a weird uh, spacing in, in a H stack for me. I still don't know why, but I just removed the spacing. So, but yeah, because I thought like it's not worth um, investigating so much for something that small. So yeah, I think it's not uh, like a 100% bulletproof solution. Sometimes you have to improvise, but the amount of confidence it gives you in your code is invaluable. So we cope basically with these tiny, tiny dots, as you said. Do you, is it uh, enough? Did, you, did I answer your question? Uh, maybe a follow-up discussion. Okay. <laughs> Hi. So um, you talked a, big, a lot about your credo of not fighting the system. Yeah. But like the system as it is right now is in constant flux still. So, for example, like we heard in the last talk, Combine, which you use heavy, pretty heavily, is slowly getting phased out. Uh, how do you plan on dealing with these changes in the future? So, I don't see how Combine is getting phased out. If you're talking about the, um, uh, the macros that are introduced by app, that's what you meant by... Okay, so the macro, if you look under the hood, because you could inspect what is the code that is generated, it's basically conforming to observable object for you and wrapping each and every property of yours in sort of what uh, ad publisher is doing. So technically they didn't go away from combined, they just made it prettier for you. <laughs> At least that's how I uh, saw the new macro. I didn't have a lot of um, hands-on experience on the macros, but it's very interesting to just click and see the code that is being generated. And you could see uh, under the hood it's just creating a publisher for you, but you just don't need to write it. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, a lot of context for my question. So I'll start with a hot take. I don't think MVC is that bad. Yeah, um, no, I, 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 said, I, I didn't say it's bad. I said for each project you have your own architectures. <laughs> yeah. So I use it so extensively also. I think yeah. when you think of it not as an architecture, but like a set of principles, you know, like it was invented in the 70s by Xerox, and they had uh, to invent a computer with a graphical user interface. When you think about it this way, it's a lot easier. Like, I think even in core data, you have like a managed object model, a context, a coordinator, that's MVC basically. And uh, so in any architecture, like you said, MVC, MVV, and YMCA, uh, bl <laughs> bloating. I, love, I hope it takes uh, track, this YMCA. <laughs> yeah, uh, bloating will happen. Yeah. Like, uh, you move from the controller to the view model, it's still bloated, still like 700 lines, lines of code. So the solution, like you said, move to services or managers or coordinators or whatever you call them, or like separate the controllers. Mm. Now, uh, you said no rules, but my question is, how do you structure your stuff? Like the file tree. How do you tree. start through? But, sorry, I didn't hear it. How do you? How do you structure your stuff? Ah, like the file tree, because I think for me, that's the biggest pain point when you, like there's global stuff, uh, there's stuff like per screen, per business logic. And once you get a grip of it, I think that made against the main pain point. So my question is, how do you do it? So uh, I've worked nearly on 20 projects. Each one of them had a different file structure. I think, I think, if this problem had a solution, we're what, 20 billion on, uh, 6 billion people on this earth, for sure some smart guy would have published it and everybody would have aligned. I think this, what we're trying to search is um, a problem without a real solution, because it depends. And for example, how I currently structure my project, you can just uh, get, inf uh, get inspired by it. So we have a separate folder for everything that is view, if we're writing uh, UIKit, and if we're writing SwiftUI, then we have something, for UIKit we still use MVVM, where we have the view model, after the view model we have our model, and this model is mapped to the view, then you have different models that come from the network, which have their separate folder, you have your services, which is the networking calls. So you end up with like 20 files. And for me, it's as long as you and your colleague could in a reasonable time find a file somewhere, that's the right uh, folder structure for you. 
Like you can put everything in a single file, but it's gonna take you half an hour to just sort through them. But if you know that I'm searching for a Swift UI view to do this uh, task, then I go to my, let's say, location, let's take this one to the nearest station folder. Inside it, I have a bunch of files. One of them is labeled view. If I click it, I see Swift UI, UI kit, click. Then you see it's basically just a binary search, sort of. Uh, that's how I use the, the file system. But um, some other people, I worked also in a project where it was very rigid. It's like the structure, even you had empty file folders with one file, just because we have to. So I don't have like a, a silver bullet to give you, I wished, where uh, you could say like do this file structure, it solves all your issues, but yeah. Thank you. Sorry? Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? So? Then big round of applause for Joseph, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>